So in this video, I want to get started with atomic structure and uh, we're going to dive a bit more in depth about atomic structure and uh, the different parts of an atom. We're just going to look at a bit depth. That's actually the knowledge required to sit for an Cambridge AS level exam. So we all know or we are all very familiar with the general structure of an atom. You have a tiny nucleus right over here and then you have your electron shells. So let me go ahead and just take a circle right here. And this, let's just say, is your electron shell. It's a tiny shell and then you have your nucleus. Let's just label it. Nucleus. Or let's just name it shells because we'll just take a look at the new shells. This nucleus is further divided into subparticles known as proton, and you'll have uh, particles called neutrons. This is the basic structure of an atom that we are generally used to or generally are defined in the basic knowledge. You're also given that these atoms will have these tiny particles or almost massless particles, but with a negative charge known as electrons electrons if we uh, so if you think about in terms of radiation if you're thinking in terms of uh, radiation if this is a radioactive particle this electrons are referred to as beta particles uh, the protons will be referred to as alpha particles and the neutrons are basically neutral so these will be referred to as gamma particles it's something like that if you think about in terms of radiation but we're not thinking about radiation, we'll just think it in terms of chemistry. So let's just forget this for a while. Okay. So we, have, we want to general, we want to actually go a bit in depth into the idea of an atom. All right. So we have the nucleus and then what do we have? So we, we call these to be the shells, right? So these are the electron shells. We have all these shells that are around and we have the nucleus in the center. Now, we might have been introduced to the general idea that, you know, these electrons move in these shells. We might have or we might not have, because if we didn't have, then that's okay. That's a much better start. But if you were introduced that these electrons right here, these electrons move in, uh, move in circles or move, uh, you know, uh, linearly inside the shell, that's actually not true. So we will use some new terms to define this. So we're going to call this the principal quantum shell. This is a new name that we're going to give it to it. But you can just call it a shell, but this is the full name you have to be familiarized with, which is principal quantum shell. Now, these shells are basically a region. It's a loci or a region, loci or a region where the electron resides. That means the electrons are actually in this region of the atom. If you think about it in terms of reality, electrons are actually something like this. Let's say this is your nucleus, right? I'm just going to try to draw it. So this will be the electron structure. All right. And let's say this was your first quantum shell. Then again, let's say some electrons are over here, some over here, but they're mostly densely packed over here, over here, all in this region. Now I'm not drawing many or thousands of electrons. These are actually, let's say your sodium atom where we write uh, Na11 and 23. So all the electronic configuration, eight, uh, two, then we have one, I think, nine, ten, eleven. Yep. So this eight will be these eight electrons only, but they will be at different positions spontaneously. So within the blink of your eye, let's say the electron was positioned here, but within just a blink of your eye, the electron will now be over here. So if you actually try to capture high speed images, we don't have cameras that actually have shutter speeds that's equal to the, let's say, the movement or the speed of the electron. So that's not actually possible to actually spontaneously figure out where the electron was a split second ago before it moved its position or it changed its position. So we just draw it as like a cloud. And then within this cloud is your second principal quantum shell and so on, so on. So these shells are just regions where 
electrons can be where electrons can be this is not the perfect position where the electrons actually are but where the electrons actually can be okay so let's go ahead and change a few of the ideas right so let's go ahead and go down now if we zoom into these shells all right so let's say this is the shell this is a shell if we zoom into these shells these shells are divided into something called subshells or if we use an electron microscope or a stereo microscope and then somehow got an idea about the structure of the atom these electrons we what we figured out is tend to stay on different regions within the region so let's say this uh, circle is my region right this is the shell the circle is the region i'm going to try to make it a bit nicer yeah this circle is my region right this is the uh, shell now within this shell let's say the electrons tend to occupy these regions the most and sometimes spontaneously once or twice electrons may appear here but most of the times the electron after the photo was captured tends to be somewhere in this green region this green region is what we will call a subshell so we will call these subshells now what we discovered is let's say this is an atom and this is the first shell let's say this is the second uh, second shell then this is the third shell and so on so on right we discovered that as the shell number increases the number of regions increases as well and why does the number of regions increase is because more shell, the higher the shell number they tend to hold more electrons that means they need more spaces the electrons need more spaces to you know let's say um figure out or stay in that shell so in more positions more subshells were discovered so let's say this was my first shell now i'm going to try to draw the second shell i'm just going to try to give a rough idea okay so again we have the same let's just say we have the same i'm going to try to mark it same green region where the electrons may reside all right i'm just going to try to draw it a bit more nicely ah a bit more nicely there you go hope it was nicer so let's say this is the green region where the electrons were residing on the first shell right right here right here right here a few over here but then now what we want to do is we want to introduce let's say a red region it could be on the y-axis or on the y dimension it could be on the x dimension or let's say it's out of the atom it could be in the z dimension or it could be in the z dimension like this so this is a new region where the electrons reside some coming out of the atom some into the atom some on top of the atom in a three-dimensional axis so let's say this is my second shell Now, what if we also go ahead and move to, let's say, the third shell? So you're going to draw the shell. We will draw the green region right over here. This is my green region. Then we also um, had the red region where the electrons could reside. Right here, this is the red region. Now we'll introduce, let's just say, another blue region which is let's say behind the red region i can't uh, like this is a 2d diagram i can't represent like that let's say these areas are the blue region because the number of electrons are increasing so the electrons needs more space then let's say we have this circular path in the blue region where the electrons could reside so as you can see as shell number increases the number of regions the electron could reside also increases meaning or we can deduce from all of these is what happens is the sharp shell increases as shell number increases so what scientists decided to do is we decided to go ahead and name these sharp cells all right so we'll, we're going to call the first sub shell in a quantum shell so in a quantum shell or in a basic bigger shell, the first shop shell is going to call is going to be called the S shop shell. The second one is going to be called the P sub shell. The third one is going to be called 
the D subshell. The fourth uh, one is going to be called the F subshell. The four subshells that we actually discovered till now. So these are the subshells. That means in reality, when we had the electronic configuration on, let's just say our GCE style, which was just this random 281, that's actually not the case. What we will learn is these reside on an S subshell. Over here, some reside on an S subshell, some reside on a P subshell, some reside on an S, some reside on a P, and some reside on a D, and so on and so on. Okay, so let's try to break this down slowly. Let's take the atom sodium, for example, where the normal electronic configuration to write it simply is just 281. Now let's think about in terms of shells, all right? So this is sodium's first shell, this is sodium's uh, second shell, this is sodium's third shell. So what did we learn? We learned that the first shell in an atom is just gonna have one region because the first shell generally only holds two electrons, which is enough for just one subshell inside that shell. And that subshell is basically the shape of this you know, shell itself. So that means we're only gonna have one subshell. That's the first subshell named the S orbital. We call the subshells orbitals or the region, not the subshells, we call the regions orbitals, not the subshell. Remember the concept. The subshells, uh, we're gonna dive a dip into what's the difference between a subshell and what's the difference between an orbital, but just know that for now it's just called an S orbital. So let's say right here, this is the region, okay? This is this is the, you know, spherical region where the electrons may reside. So an S orbital looks something like this. It's just the shape of a regular sphere, all right? If you want to draw a smaller diagram, this is how we would draw. If this were axes, if we're thinking in terms of dimensions, it's just a X, Y. It's just a spherical shell. So if you want to represent the electronic configuration of sodium in terms of how they're arranged in their subshells inside their shells, we will actually consider it something like this. We're going to first write the letter one. This one means this is the quantum or principal shells. I'm just going to write it principal because that's the easier word to remember. So principal, uh, sorry, principal shell. Then we're gonna write S. This is the uh, orbital slash energy level. They can also be represented as energy levels because electrons contain some sort of energy. That means the S orbital can only hold up to two electrons. So you're gonna put two. Remember, each orbital, what we have discovered that on, each orbital can only hold up to one electron, not more than that. Each orbital will only hold up to one electron, not more than that. And I'm going to show you the reason pretty much in a second. And you might be thinking that, all right, if each orbital holds one electron, if this was an S and P orbital, how are there eight electrons where it could just have been four, which we're going to discover in just a second. Okay, so we have completed our first step. We've written the tiny electronic configuration right here. So this is what we're going to try to focus on. Let me just go ahead and uh, put a box around it. We're trying to focus on energy levels for a while. Oops. Yep. All right, so that's it. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the second shell. So what did we learn in our second shell? We're going to have the green region, of course. But let's just go ahead and try to draw it in a bit more center because we know that we will have another region. So let's say this is our green region. This green region only occupies one electron. But remember, we talked about axes. We talked about three-dimensional axes right here. Look at this red region. Uh, this red region right here. This red region. This red region, what I'm talking about. So let's say we have some faith. Let me try to draw the red region. Oops, let me just go and bring that back. If I try to draw this red region, um, it's coming from either sides of the axes like this. So 
this forward one, this one is representing the Z dimension, this is representing the Y dimension, this is representing the X dimensions. Now again, this is a 2D platform, so I really can't show you how the model actually looks. But let's go ahead and try to bring in. So the second shell, this one right here, will have an S and P, right? So since S orbitals can only hold up to two, let's go ahead and bring it for a second shell, S orbital. Oops, let's just go and do that. S orbital. Again, the S orbital always looks the same no matter what the shell number is or whatever. So it's just the Y and the, oops, and the X, Y and X. However, but now you have to hold up the P orbital. So remember, th this is the difference between the, uh, the, the difference between the subshell. So the thing P, the whole thing P is called a subshell. But again, we also talked about dimensions. That means these dimensions, let's say the Y dimension, the X dimension, the Z dimension, each of the dimension of the loci, the dimension of the loci is known as the orbital. Dimension of the loci is known as the orbital, but if we draw them together, where it's X, Y, and Z, this whole thing is known as the subshell. That's what you'll see in some you know, science books. The atom is actually drawn something like this because of this region. This is how the atoms are drawn in some science books. So we'll bring in the P orbitals now. So right here, oops, I really don't know what just happened, but right here. So this right here is the P orbital, P orbital. Now this P orbital has different regions and the P orbital, what we have discovered is they're like this, this like, they're like this star shape, this shape right here, this shape right here. So the shape is actually represented by a lobe. So we have the, oops, I labeled it wrong, Y and we have the X. So right here, this is what we call the PX orbital, all right? So if I remove the axes, this is how the orbital actually just looks like, right? This is, let's say, our one red region. So if I actually try to draw it with that red coloring, this is one red region. This is one red region. Then we also have the PY orbital. So this is another dimension of the P orbital in the three dimensions, right? This is another dimension, the PY, X, Y, okay. So this is another, this is one of another red regions. And then we also have the three dimensions, right? So we also have something in the Z direction. So this is the Y, this is the Z, and this is the X. Right here, right here. This is how the Z dimension looks. Now, obviously since it's 3D, I really can't show it, but let's say something is going into the page and some things are coming out of the page, it's something, like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and choose a pixel eraser. So let's remove it. I'm going to try to represent it. So that's like out of the page, right? That's that's the dimension out of the page. And this is something that's into the page. So this is out of the page. This is outwards. And this is inwards. So what you're gonna to do to represent this is we're gonna write the number two. This represents the, again, shell number two. We're in the second shell. Then we're gonna put an S over here. So how many electrons can the S orbital hold? Yes, that's right, it's two electrons. And so now we have eight minus, which is six electrons remaining. Now these six electrons, each two of them will go to each P orbital, thus filling up the P subshell. All the electrons will fill up the P subshell, but each electron will go into each P orbital. So each P orbital will receive two electrons, making a total of six electrons. So we're just gonna write them together. So two S2, then this two represents the second shell once again, and this P represents the orbital in the second shell, and this power represents the number of electrons in that shell. And finally, we're gonna go to the third shell which is also gonna be bringing up the d orbitals. Now, the thing is sodium does not have enough electrons to fill up the d orbital. It just only has one electron left. 
So that means it's going to fill up an s orbital once again, and just one electron. Why is it going to fill up just an s orbital? Well, the third shell itself will have the s orbitals, which is just a sphere. It will have all the three p orbitals, which will look something like this, s, p, and then d orbitals. For the A-level syllabus, you really don't need to know how the d orbitals actually look. But d orbitals will have different uh, lobe structures. So this is the first lobe structure. This is the second lobe structure. This is the uh, third lobe structure. And finally, we have, this is the uh, fourth lobe structure. It's only in the y and the z directions. Very difficult to show. And finally, we have the fifth lobe structure, which also has a circular disk. So it's very different to what we actually know. This is known as, uh, let's say, z, y, and this is known as x, y, this is known as x, z, this is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is known as the y, z, and this is, sorry, this is known as the y, x, this is known as the y, z, and this is known as the y square, and, uh, oops, this is the x square minus y square. So they, are, they have different structures, which we don't need to know. We This is not included in the syllabus, but we do need to know that the d orbitals exist, and each d orbital can still hold up to 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. So 1, 2, 3, one, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So the d orbitals can hold up to total 10 electrons. The p orbitals can hold up to 6 electrons. And the s orbital can hold this orbital up to two electrons. So this is how the shape of the orbital or an orbital structure works. This is how you write the electronic configuration. Now let's say we have aluminum, all right? This is another element, aluminum with 13. How would you write the electronic configuration in terms of the orbitals? Well, it's very simple. It's just going to be 1s2. So let's write the normal electronic configuration first. It's just 2, 8, 3, uh, 19, 11, 12, 13, yeah, 2, 8, 3. So the two electrons from the first shell go to the s orbital. Now from the second shell, for the second shell, if I go to the second shell right over here, this is my second shell, we're going to have to divide it between s and p. So the s orbital receives 2, and the p orbital is further divided into x, y and z each receiving two of them and a total of six electrons so we're going to have two uh, two s2 and you're going to have two p6 because the total is six electrons and on the third shell you're going to have an s orbital we're going to have a p orbital we're going to have a d orbital now we can omit this because it, there's not enough enough electrons to fill up the d orbital so from the three electrons two will go to the P, uh, s orbitals and one of the electrons will either go to the x y and z now just for the sake of science we fill them up in order so it's going to go from x to z and that really doesn't actually matter so you can write 3s2 and then we can write 3p1 so in total we have 2 plus 8 plus 3 so this is one shell, this is the third shell, this is the second shell, this is the first shell. So in the next video, we're going to talk about electron spin diagrams and the structure of an electron and how they reside in an atom. For now, let's just go ahead and recap all the things we have learned. So in an atom, the circular shells are actually not where the electrons reside. Electrons reside on an electron cloud or a density where the electrons exist in a shell. That means they don't move in a circular motion in the shells. We have to keep in mind that. Now, the region where the electrons move inside that loci, that loci itself, the shells, this shell itself has a different region known as subshells. Subshells increase or the number of subshells increase as shell number increases because there are more electrons to reside in the subshell. So for the first uh, shell, we're going to have only one subshell. For the second shell, we're going to have an, a one plus one subshell. That's the S and P subshell. The P itself has three orbitals, which is the X, Y, and Z. And then we're going to have the D subshell uh, in the third shell. So it's going to be the S right over here, the P right over here, and the D right over here. And the D has five orbitals. The P has three orbitals and the S has two orbitals. This is how to remember it. And we're gonna study about Fs and all that in a bit later or in your A2 course, but for now we only need to know about D orbitals. 
And to write the electronic configuration of an atom, this is going to be, let's say, sodium and A, which is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3p1. Or the normal electronic configuration, 281. So we have 2, we have 8, and we have 1 in the third shell. This is how we write the electronic configuration for A levels using subshell concept. So the next video you're going to catch up with uh, more uh, details and in-depth of electron spin diagrams and how the electrons reside. And probably we're going to go a bit more depth into ionization energies of an atom. But till then, see ya.